Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Ms. Landis, I had a question for you. As we look at the, uh, the process for allocating the $2.7 billion that have been continuously uh, appropriated to the Water Commission, the, uh, a couple, uh, uh, Steve Lopez of the LA Times has criticized the California Coastal Commission for the agent process of lobbying and influencing the commission and whether or not there is enough transparency in that. How does the Water Commission deal with the politicization of the $2.7 billion and, uh, and how much pressure and, and the spotlight that is on the Water Commission as to how that money will be spent? Is there the transparency necessary for this, uh, this responsibility that you have? Um, I think we probably have the most transparent process out there, maybe transparent to a fault, because of Bagley Keene. Um, the commissioners, well, you may be subject to the same, I don't know, cannot meet with more than a quorum. They can't communicate. They, anytime anyone uh, approaches them or they meet or give a presentation, they have to report that out at every meeting. Um, the commissioners uh, are very admirable group of people. They're volunteers. They're committed to doing something good for the state. I, in my uh, experience, they have all been very fair and responsive to uh, messages they hear from members of the public or from advocacy groups. Great. Thank you, Ms. Landis. I want to thank all four of you on the panel. You took a lot of questions, but you also reported out about the, the process you're engaged in, providing the accountability that the state deserves, and uh, I think it speaks to your professionalism and uh, the seriousness by which you take this task that is before you and which the voters have entrusted all of us to make sure uh, is invested in the way that will pay dividends for California for a long time to come for California's water security. Thank you all very much. At this time, I'd like to invite the next panel. We have Executive Director Donnelly from the Wildlife Conservation Board, Exe Executive Officer Shuket from the State Coastal Conservancy, and Executive Officer Brandon from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. When, uh, when they join us, they are going to be here to uh, help us learn more about the progress we are making in restoration. All right, thank you to all three of you for joining us, and Executive Director Donnelly, uh, at your pleasure. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is John Donnelly. I'm the Executive Director of the Wildlife Conservation Board. And to begin with, the Wildlife Conservation Board was authorized to administer the California Stream Flow Enhancement Program, which supports projects that provide meaningful and measurable increases in the availability and quality of water in streams statewide. Through the program, we have defined enhanced stream flow as a change in the amount, timing, or quality of water flowing down a stream or a portion of a stream for fish and wildlife. We kicked off development of the program uh, at the beginning of last year uh, by holding three public workshops around the state in conjunction with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, it was consistent with the Prop 1 requirements that we hold these initial meetings to develop ideas and get questions answered uh, that we had to develop the program. In addition, in, in cooperation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we also held a meeting with the tribes around the state as a form of consultation. Subsequently, staff developed program guidelines and criteria which were approved by the Wildlife Conservation Board at a public meeting in July of last year, in June of last year. A formal solicitation followed and was developed along with specific scoring criteria and was subsequently presented to the Wildlife Conservation Board at a public meeting and approved. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Board uh, was allocated $38.4 million in this year's budget uh, of a total amount which was allocated in Proposition 1 of $200 million. WCB, as through a public process at the meeting where the uh, guidelines and criteria were approved, we identified up to $5 million to use for planning and with the remaining $33.4 million to be used for project implementation which included restoration and acquisition type projects. 
a proposal solicitation notice knowing notifying potential candidates and applicants of availability of funding was approved for distribution by the Wildlife Conservation Board in July of 2015. 76 proposals with a value of just over $76 million were received at the closing of the solicitation at the end of September in 2015. Each proposal received, received in the, each proposal we received in-house received an administrative review and a technical review. And the technical review performed included three technical reviewers. And the results of those reviews were presented to a selection panel in January of this year, just this past month. Proposals were ranked using a scoring criteria developed in part with public and agency uh, partners and then approved by our board during the solicitation uh, meeting that was held back in June. The criteria developed aimed at a cap to capture a proposal's significance of ecological benefits, the ability to advance statewide or regional goals and plans, durability of that investment, cost effectiveness, and level of community support and collaboration, which included disadvantaged community considerations. Uh, we, in our uh, criteria and scoring criteria, we provided additional points for disadvantaged community type projects. Proposals that scored well and were approved by the selection panel will be presented to the Wildlife Conservation Board for a final decision on February 18th. The meeting agenda is being finalized at this particular time for distribution of the uh, projects as well as the agenda by February 8th or Monday of next week. Going forward, we are planning to hold a public workshop later this spring to gather information on what worked and did not work well from an applicant's perspective during our first solicitation and use this information to guide a new solicitation process and for distribution in the summer of 2016. Uh, with that, I'll end. Uh, and essence of time and be happy to answer any Thank questions. Thank you, Mr. Shuckett. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good morning. I'm Sam Shuckett, the Executive Officer of the State Coastal Conservancy. As you probably know, the Conservancy was created to protect coastal watersheds and resources and create opportunities for the public to get out and enjoy these resources. We work in all coastal counties in California and all nine Bay Area counties, so about a third of the state's land area and about three quarters of its population is within our jurisdiction. We have $100 million of Prop 1 money under Chapter 6 to administer. Uh, all of the funding decisions are made by the Conservancy Board at public meetings held at different locations around the state. We have a seven-person board that includes Secretary Laird, Department of Finance, two other gubernatorial appointees, Chair of the Coastal Commission, and one appointee each from the Assembly and one from the Senate, along with six legislative oversight members. Our our enabling legislation has a very broad mandate, and we are no stranger to multi-benefit projects as a result. In implementing uh, Proposition 1, Chapter 6, we are seeking to implement multi-benefit projects that advance state plans, such as the State California Water Action Plan and the Safeguarding California Plan, which is the climate change adaptation plan. Like the other Prop 1 programs that you've heard of, we developed our grant guidelines through a public process that included three public meetings around the state last spring. In addition and in parallel to that process, we also updated our strategic plan, which now contains quantified numeric goals and objectives for what we intend to do with uh, Proposition 1 funds. Out of looking at the bond, our own statute, the safeguarding plan, and the California Water Action Plan, we identified four priorities for Coastal Conservancy funding going forward. Those are anadromous fish habitat improvements, wetland restoration, water sustainability, and urban greening. These priorities implement several goals of the Water Action Plan, including promoting water conservation, increasing regional self-reliance, protecting important ecosystems, improving groundwater management, and increasing flood protection. Examples of the kinds of projects that do this are include wetland restoration projects that restore ecosystems and protect shorelines from future sea level rise, urban greening projects that recharge groundwater, reduce irrigation needs, make cities nicer places to live, sequester carbon, reduce the urban heat island effect, and so on. Restoration of fish habitat that also reduces flooding and agricultural projects that provide on-site storage while dedicating in-stream flow. 
We intend to, and we are in the process of holding four Prop 1 grant rounds every fiscal year for a total of five years. Some rounds will be focused on specific kinds of projects. The second round in this fiscal year, for instance, is focused on anadromous fish habitat. Some rounds will f focus on particular regions. Our fourth and final round in the fiscal year will be focused on urban greening projects in Los Angeles County. In round one, we received 54 applications requesting $58 million in total. We will be recommending 10 of those projects totaling $4 million to our Conservancy Board. The complete list of projects is posted on our website. The first two projects were approved by the Conservancy Board last week. Nine, of, nine out of the 10 projects recommended for funding in our round one are located in disadvantaged communities. Round two, anadromous fish currently under review, we have received 33 applications requesting $13 million. And I want to thank the folks uh, at the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife as well as the National Marine Fisheries Service for helping out with the reviews on our, on our fish projects as an example of using outside experts to help with, help with the review process. Uh, we present an annual financial report to our board and to the public every fall, including how we're doing in terms of funding disadvantaged communities. Over the last 15 years, we have awarded about a billion dollars in grants, both in terms of the number of projects and amount of money. 40% of that has gone to disadvantaged communities. And um, last year, every dollar the Conservancy awarded leveraged $3 of federal, local, or private funds. In the aggregate over the last 30 years, we have leveraged every state dollar with more than $2.50 of non-state funding. And I was stuck in traffic on the way up here, so I got to find out that we have just received one quarter of the total federal uh, National Coastal Wetland Program money for the country, uh, $5.5 million for nine coastal conservancy projects here in California. Um, we think that uh, in implementing projects in disadvantaged communities, you need more than just outreach and transparency. We work with local partners to develop projects, including supporting their plans and providing technical assistance to get projects permitted through CEQA. We've provided both grant funds and staff time to help plan and develop projects in communities with limited got about resources 30 seconds. and capacity. Uh, and to that end, we are now in a partnership with the California Endowment who can help fund the uh, sort of the community organizing end of work in disadvantaged communities that we cannot uh, easily fund with uh, bond money. Thank you, Mr. Shiket, and congratulations on the big announcement. Mr. Branham. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Jim Branham with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. Um, the benefit of going last is I can say us too to a lot of what you've heard process-wise. I won't talk much about um, those processes. They're very similar. I think we went through a, a public process. We did award um, grants in the first week of December, our first Prop 1 grants. Um, we will award some more in March. Um, and so I want to talk about a couple things that are a little different um, with our program. First, let me say that our, our region is one quarter of the state. Sierra Nevada Conservancy covers um, uh, all a part of 22 counties. We've been about, around about 10 years. Our allocation in Proposition 1 was $25 million. Um, and it's the home of about more than t close to two-thirds of the state's developed water supply or, um, originates in our region. Um, we have focused our first uh, first two years of grants, and it's a $10 million appropriation, on the issue of forest health. Um, that is the issue we believe in our region that presents the greatest threat to California's water supply and reliability. Um, it is um, a, an issue that when we decided to focus on that, um, we were thinking about dead trees, but the tree mortality issue has become so severe that it, is, it made it obvious to any of us that that is a major problem that we need to focus on. Um, we've also focused on that because of all the other programs that are, exist out there under Prop 1 and elsewhere that do a variety of things. You heard um, Director Bonham talk a, about, a lot about meadow restoration. So we certainly felt there was funds to take care of uh, many of those issues, and we could work in concert to really focus more on the, the forest health. Uh, that forest restoration that we think needs to occur to help uh, uh, minimize the risk and the impacts of these unusually large and severe fires that we've seen in this year over the last few years. Um, we 
we are guided by the California Water Action Plan, by AB 32 scoping plan, a number of plans that are in place that really identify the multi-benefits um, that come from these kind of projects. When we have Forest Healthy, they not only improve water supply, water quality, water reliability, they keep carbon stored in trees instead of putting up in the air as greenhouse gases, and they uh, can reduce the amount of particulate matter that these wildfires put into the air. So we work very closely um, to try to figure out how do we integrate a program across our region in our watersheds. Um, what are we funding? What are the other entities funding, whether it's Prop 1 or other funds, to try to make sure that we're not, um, we're not just in essence, funding random acts of restoration. We're trying to think about how do we do this holistically, how do we connect, and we spend a lot of time working with Wildlife Conservation Board, Fish and Wildlife, CAL FIRE, which doesn't have Prop 1 funds, but have a lot of their funds to do this in a way that is integrated and coordinated. Um, we have organized ourselves around something called the Sierra Nevada Watershed Improvement Program. It's a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service, who manage about half of the, for half of the forest lands uh, in the Sierra Nevada. Um, Secretary Laird has entered into an MOU to guide that, so it has really helped us focus a lot of our energy and uh, efforts and try to coordinate to achieve those maximum outcomes. I did want to mention one point to Mr. Dodd's point, and, and Director Bonham talked uh, about the statute and the requirement of competitive grants. We certainly have many of those communities and many of those groups who are not terribly sophisticated or have the resources to put together the best application. We try to be guided in our grant programs to select the best project, not the best application. Um, but we also work with those applicants up to the point of submission. We don't think a competitive process eliminates our ability to try to folks help, help folks understand the targets of our program the evaluation criteria we're using and help them to give us the best application. We think the bottom line is to do the best projects. At the point it's submitted, it becomes very competitive and we follow those same processes. So um, with that, I think I will um, try to beat the buzzer and see if I did that and um, be happy to answer any questions. So thank you. You've got a winner today. Thank you, Mr. Branham. This, uh, thanks so, so much for sharing with us kind of how things are going. I know during the negotiations on the bond, the appropriations process by which the grants would be made by the conservancies was an issue that uh, many struggled with. And, uh, you know, is that working out now? And, uh, and of course, the alternative, in hindsight, would that have been better or worse, as you had imagined? I, I mean, I think it's working out fairly well. As Jim mentioned, we believe strongly in funding the best projects, not the best proposals, and that means working with at all the any grantee who wants to basically we will we will work with mm -hmm. uh it's worth noting that for disadvantaged communities uh the disadvantage doesn't stop with the application process mm -hmm. after the award you are typically dealing with smaller ngos smaller cities less sophisticated accounting systems yeah. and that can be problematic uh with with state funding as well but i think it's working out I think it's working out fairly well. Uh, I also agree with Sam's comments. I'd just like to add, you know, we welcome the opportunity to work with our grant applicants prior to the solicitation going out. And that does two things. It, you know, it brings in those unsophisticated organizations that might not otherwise be able to compete. But then, too, it also, in my mind, creates a better project, potentially going forward through the solicitation process. And what I'm looking forward to is after our first round of grants are awarded, announced and awarded, I'm looking forward to meeting with those organizations that did, you know, didn't quite meet the bar uh, in our program this year and be working with those to, to take a look at the application, critique the application for them and assist them in preparing another application particularly or potentially to go forward in the next solicitation go around. Any questions for our panel? Mr. Bigelow. Thank you for Mr. Branham. I know your organization has worked hard in, in the Sierras to try to address a number of issues, watershed being one of those key components, and I know you've helped sponsor some watershed groups' formations. Uh, how are they faring in the outcome of the funds that potentially they could receive in, in respect to and in light of our recent tragedy of fires that uh, put us all in difficult situations where competing communities were fighting over the same limited fire resources. Um, how are they able to stand up and compete for these dollars so that we can actually maybe get in and thin our forests a little bit and 
do some corrective measures in those areas, such as we he heard about the meadows and areas that are impacted by the overgrowth and now the overwhelming dead trees that exist throughout our state? Uh, you know, I think we're seeing progress. I think the way that um, community organizations or communities have come together with uh, the unusual bedfellows who were, have been fighting forever and have kind of realized the forest was going to hell, if you pardon my language, it's around dying. them. Yeah, and now we see it very graphically. Um, so we're making some progress. Um, it wouldn't surprise you to say we could use a lot more resources to address the problem. The magnitude of it is, is um, somewhat overwhelming. Um, but I think we've laid the groundwork. And I think as we look at the governor's emergency proclamation on tree mortality, as we look at the programs that CAL FIRE is putting on the ground to address that and the forest health issues, as we try to work more to, with our federal partners to see if we can uh, engage them with some additional um, activity, you know, the groundwork has been laid. Um, it's just a, it's a massive problem. And I think the groups we've worked with are having some success, and we want to continue to, to move them forward. I would mention one of the things that a lot of them have worked on is that I know Mr. Daly is well aware of is the ability to develop some additional infrastructure, particularly to handle biomass. Um, we are losing infrastructure at a rapid rate. Um, Community-scaled infrastructure to handle the biomass would be a tremendous benefit to get more re restoration done, and that's a challenge where we're not having as much success on as we'd like. I appreciate that because uh, I was going to bring up the, the biomass, and I was also going to bring up the fact that our federal partners, you know, with a, a large segment of the lands in the state of California being federal, how are you able to fare in, in bridging that gap that sometimes we don't sometimes do well with each other in, in dealing with that. And thank you for bringing up the biomass because that's important, not just to Mr. Daly, but in my district as well. Yes, I'm well aware of that as well. Um, um, yeah, the, working with across those boundaries is, is can be challenging. I think we've got a very good working relationship with the U.S. Forest Service. They're partnering on the Watershed Improvement Program. I'll also mention that Secretary Lair just entered into an agreement under the uh, federal farm bill that provides for good neighbor authority, which could create a tool where more work could be done on federal lands that could be done by others, consistent with obviously their land management objectives and, and their rules and regulations. But it might be a tool that allows us to, to get some more work done there, um, because that is a critical component, obviously, of the watershed, and they are the largest well, land Hopefully manager. we can get a lot, a lot more done, because I know the last of the biomass plants, other than the two private ones that are owned by a private company are going to close and they are going to leave and they've already been purchased. Yep. Okay. All right. At this time, I'd like to say thank you to the three of you. Thank you to the work that your conservancies do across our state. I know so many of my constituents, so many Californians really rely on, uh, on your leadership. So thank you for that through the years for your agencies. Next, I would like to call up the stakeholder panel. It's important to, uh, to recognize that they don't encompass all stakeholders in California, nor do they represent the views of all stakeholders uh, in California, but, uh, but it's important that we invite uh, many voices to participate in these panels uh, and, and in these oversight hearings, and so I'm grateful that they can be here today. We have Bo Mazzetti, chairman of the Rincon Band of the Luceno Indians, Craig uh, Tucker, natural resources policy advocate of the Carrick Tribe, Cindy Tuck, the Deputy Executive Director of the Association of California Water Agencies, Danny Merkley, Director of Water Resources, California Farm Bureau Federation, Laurel Firestone, Co-Director and Attorney at Law of the Community Water Center, and Doug Obiji, Senior Attorney, Natural Resources Defense Council Water Program. If I said someone else's name and you're filling in for one of them, please forgive me. Uh, and uh, We can begin now with... Uh, Mr. Mazzetti, Chairman Mazzetti, please. Okay. Uh, first, uh, Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the tribal perspective. Uh, Secretary Laird said something. He said, lack of trust. In his speech this morning. Also, when we talk about stakeholders, I want to uh, make sure that we understand Tribes are governments. There's 109 tribal governments in the state of California. So when you say stakeholders, uh, we have some issues with that. We're government-to-government -government relationships, and we need to pursue that. <clears throat> I would, on the other hand, like to commend Secretary Laird. Uh, he grasps the idea and concept and the fact 
the government-to-government relationship we have with the state of California. He, he and his staff, uh, starting with the, uh, also I, I have to mention uh, uh, Felicita Marcos, the chairperson of the State Water Resources Board. They grasp and they've done an outstanding job of government-to-government relationship with the tribes throughout the state. When you have the <coughs> Groundwater Sustainability Act, and I'm gonna start there, that was a real awakening for tribes. The state's after our water. Well, you gotta understand what the bill said. Tribes are addressed. Tribes are protected. Tribes can be partners. That's the main thing. We need to work together. And I go back to Secretary Laird and, and his department. Uh, I, I can't uh, say enough about, uh, I've been involved with this for quite a few years, government. Never in my lifetime has there been the relationship and the outreach that Secretary Laird and his department, Mark Cohen, who's the chief, and specifically Anacita Augustines, who is the tribal liaison. <clears throat> the effort that they've made to explain Proposition 1 and the Groundwater Sustainability Act, I've never seen anything like it as far as really trying to explain it and trying to get the tribes to work together. We will. We will work together on this. Water has no boundary. It knows no reservation boundary, property line. So we're all in this together, and we know it. So we're working together, but I, I can't get over the, the effort that's been made the outreach, the understanding of what the bill is, what Proposition 1 is. Proposition 1, we have some little areas we need to work on and understand. <clears throat> one is by various departments of requiring a tribe to waive sovereign immunity versus partial sovereign immunity. Or, there's ways to work through these issues. If we all sit down together, we can work through that sovereign immunity problem. We have limited waivers of sovereign immunity all tribes are pretty much aware of nowadays. That's how we can work together. So we need to work with the departments. The other area that creates a little issue or problem is the, uh, the state water uh, code. It talks about public agencies, okay? It doesn't mention tribes, which is fine. That's the way things evolved. But the lack of explaining that a public agency could be a tribal government poses issues, poses access problems for various programs with tribes. So maybe we can look at the, uh, some of those areas to, it's just an interpretation, a tribe, not a public agency. So if we can maybe look at some of those things, we can open up more of these programs. But I will tell you, and I'm firm in what I'm saying, tribes want to work together. Thank God it's not a us versus you anymore. Hopefully those days are kind of gone. I will say you could see the, the uh, Klamath project, heavy, heavy tribal involvement in that project. As a team, that's what we need to do, partners. You also have the Salton Sea project, major, Torres Martinez tribe, major federal funds in that, again, with the tribe. So we need to partner up. The tribes can bring in the federal funds where they can, and tribal funds. Uh, but I want to go back to what this oversight hearing is about. Is the outreach here for tribes? Yes, it is. I've personally been with the staff from the Oregon border down to San Diego. So is there outreach going? Yes. If a tribe needs something, that department's ready to explain it through Anacita Augustine's, the department tribal liaison. But I must, again, I, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough, these folks have been doing an outstanding job of explaining and outreaching on a government-to-government -government basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We'll next move to Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Craig Tucker. I'm the Natural Resources Policy Advocate for the Karuk Tribe. And Karuk, with about 4,000 members, is about the third largest tribe in the state. The Karuk reside uh, on the middle Klamath River, spanning Humboldt and Siskiyou counties. They've been there since the beginning of time. The Karuk are a salmon-dependent people. Salmon are part of the Karuk's cultural identity, part of their cultural practices, part of their religious practices. And over time, uh, degradation to the fisheries and water quality in the Klamath has really impaired Karuk's ability to subsistence fish and maintain that cultural identity. So I want to talk about 
uh, a specific way that Prop 1 can help with that issue, and then some more broad, general ways that Prop 1 relates to Karuk and other tribes. Um, specifically, I have to say that Secretary Laird stole some of my thunder. I was hoping to be the one to tell you about um, the resurrection of the Klamath Dam Removal Agreement. Uh, as many of you know, there are a package of agreements sewn together that we placed before Congress that failed to pass Congress at the end of the last session, and uh, many thought these deals were dead. But uh, I think you'll see today that California, Oregon, Pacific Corps, the owner of those dams, and the United States will be announcing plans to move forward with the dam removal agreement uh, without the need of an act of Congress and without the need of any federal funding. And this is made possible in part by uh, money from Proposition 1, $250 million, which California committed to when it signed this agreement in uh, 2010. So we're incredibly excited about that. Uh, I would note that I think a lot of people, when you talk about removing dams in an era of uh, drought, uh, some people think that sounds crazy. I'll just point out that the Klamath dams that we're trying to remove provide no irrigation diversions and no drinking water diversions. Um, and I would say if part of the goal is to provide water security for agriculture. One way you do that is by having sustainable fisheries. The healthier our fish runs are, uh, the less of a burden uh, will be demanded of agriculture for helping maintain good water quality and adequate flows. Um, uh, Proposition 1 creates a lot of opportunity for tribal communities. We have the same problems that everybody else has. Um, we have aging water infrastructure for drinking water. Uh, we have a lot of restoration work that needs to go on in tribal communities to improve water quality. Uh, Prop 1 includes a lot of money that we're eligible for in order to carry out those projects. But I will point out, um, although I agree with Chairman Manzetti's uh, view that this administration has done a commendable job of outreaching to tribes. In fact, I think uh, Governor Brown's executive order requiring California agencies and departments to develop a consultation policy with Indian tribes is huge. I think it's really moved forward California's relationship with Indian nations uh, in a huge way. Uh, but there are some stumbling blocks. And for example, uh, one of the consequences of that order is that every agency and many of the departments within those agencies is independently developing a consultation policy. So guys like me are getting uh, phone calls from uh, a couple of dozen different departments and agencies wanting to consult on a consultation policy. And it's, um, you know, we're a relatively large tribe and don't have the manpower and capacity to do all that. And I know a lot of the smaller tribes are getting left out. Um, similarly, when we get grant dollars from the state, and we experienced this with Prop 84, and we expect to experience this again with Prop 1, uh, whatever department or agency is um, brokering the grant, there's typically some sort of contractual relationship that requires tribes to uh, have some sort of partial waiver of sovereign immunity, and that gets negotiated, but then we have to negotiate it every time with each grant-making entity. We think there should be some opportunities through government-to-government -government meetings with the state to uh, streamline some of these things so that we're not having to negotiate independently with this sort of multitude of California agencies and California departments. Um, state funding like this also asks tribes to comply with certain state laws that as independent sovereign nations we've never had to comply with before. And it's actually um, for Karuk and I think other tribes certainly in our region and probably down in Southern California as well, it's a little bit of a deterrent sometimes to apply for the money because we're asked to comply with uh, regulations, laws, policies of the state of California when it's not things we've ever had to deal with before because um, we typically rely on federal, federal jurisdiction for things like that. Um, you know, it's really impossible f for me or for a panel like this to really represent all the concerns of Indian country in California. As, as the chairman pointed out, there's 109 federally recognized tribes. They're all culturally distinct. Um, they're all vary in size. They all vary in what the resources needs are. So we encourage you guys to have um, a hearing like this that's focused solely on tribes. And I think as you empower tribes to be a better participant and a better partner, um, we can bring resources to the table to solve a lot of these critical issues, providing water, clean water for rivers and fish, and also seconds, for sir. agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker.